Over 10,000 years ago, the UK was a very different place. With large glaciers covering the ground, we and many of our modern species shared the snowy landscape with a host of now extinct wildlife. Brown bears, grey wolves and woolly rhinos would have been a familiar sight to our ancestors, but so too would have been the Eurasian lynx. For many years it was thought that the lynx was a creature of prehistoric Britain and foreign to our modern landscapes, so therefore not suitable for reintroductions. However, recent evidence has come out that suggests that the lynx may have shared our wooded highlands with us as recently as 300 years ago. This sparked the idea that perhaps the lynx is actually a missing link that would help us restore our ecosystems back to full health. Subscribe to Ferroforest to keep learning about UK nature. In the late 1700s, Richard Pocock created a manuscript that recorded over 50 animal species that were living in Scotland at that time. One passage within this manuscript caused a lot of curiosity when it was discovered this decade. They have also a wild cat, three times as big as the common cat, as the polecat is less. They are of a yellow-red colour, their breasts and sides white. They take fowls and lambs and breed two at a time. I was assured that they sometimes bring forth in a large bird's nest to be out of reach of dogs, and tis said they will attack a man who would attempt to take their young. How would we describe the Eurasian lynx? Three times as big as a common cat. They're certainly closer than any other Scottish carnivore to fit that description. Of a yellow-red colour? Absolutely, their fur can range from greys through golden browns all the way to reds. Their breasts and sides white. Another perfect fit, all lynx have white undersides. They take fowls and lambs? This is a close match. Although the lynx prefers to eat roe deer and calves of red deer, if, like in the Scottish 1700s, these species are absent, they will eat the next best choice, pheasants, grouse, hares and lambs. Breed two at a time? Well, the lynx can have between one and four cubs, but usually has two to three, so this fits. Sometimes bring forth in a large bird's nest to be out of reach of dogs? This is the loosest fitting section, as lynx usually give birth at the base of a tree or within dense vegetation. However, lynx have been observed climbing up trees in order to escape from predators, and they've even been seen giving birth in hollows within trees partway up. So it's not really the biggest stretch of imagination to think of a man with his dog stumbling across a lynx that had taken its cubs to the top of a tree to get out of way after sensing them. Will attack a man who would attempt to take their young. This final statement is absolutely possible. In fact, of the animals where mothers raise their young, I think you'd be hard pressed to find one that wouldn't attack if she thought her offspring were in danger. So is this passage from the 1700s actually proof that lynx were here such a short time ago and are not in fact ancient relics of an ecosystem that no longer exists here? We may never know for sure, but I think it's a pretty strong piece of evidence. And if it is, then what other evidence might exist to suggest that the lynx lived in Britain more recently than 1500 years ago? Our evidence timeline takes us from the 500s to the early 700s then the 1100s, the 1400s, the 1500s, and into the early 1600s, before finally ending at our most recent piece of evidence, Richard Pocock's account in the 1700s. We start back in the 500s, or more accurately at some time between 425 and the year 600, where our most definitive evidence of lynx living in Britain comes from. Now we found three skeletal remains of lynx, two in North Yorkshire and one in Sutherland, and when these were dated, they were found to have been living between those two years that I mentioned. This shows that lynx were at the very least living in Britain at the start of the medieval period. However, given how geographically spread out these remains are, it suggests that they are simply representatives of a bigger, healthier, widespread population of lynx in Britain. Next, we jump forward to the early 700s, where a Latin text was written that's known as Vita Sancti Cuthberti, the author was from Northumbria, which is just slightly north of North Yorkshire, where we know that a few hundred years beforehand there were healthy lynx populations. Within the text is a warning to shepherds that, when translated to English, reads, Learn, shepherds, through vigilant guard by the sheepfolds, to guard against nocturnal ambush and dusky lions. There is generally the opinion that different words for big cats were used interchangeably throughout the first millennium in different contexts. 
This includes words like lion, wildcat, leopard and lynx. Now because lions haven't actually been native in Britain since the cave lions of the Pleistocene, there's a fair chance that this word dusky lions is actually a reference to the dark fur of our native lynx. In the 700s, shepherds were still being warned that these nocturnal predators might be in the area. Further texts were appearing in the 1100s. A British animal collector mentioned that England does not produce lynx. However, a Welsh text mentioned that battlefield carrion got fed to lynx in order to keep them happy. Perhaps these texts are markers of lynx range reductions, with some still clinging on in Wales, but the English population having vanished. Still, perhaps not, as the lynx does appear to be mentioned in a hunting manual written by the Duke of York in the 1400s. Here he refers to a wild cat that's the size of a wolf and has the appearance of a short-tailed leopard. This cat is seen hiding away from men with dogs by running up trees, it's seen caring for two kittens at a time, and it also dwells within hollow trees. If this description sounds familiar, think back to the description from the document in the 1700s. Both appear to be describing similar characteristics of the lynx, although in slightly different words. Heading into the 1500s, we come across a text that describes the fur of lynxes and is written by one of Britain's earliest naturalists. This text was translated into English. Our countrymen call it Luzan. It is doubtful whether we should call it Luntz or lynx in the affinity of the words. His skin is vised by noblemen and is sold for a great price. These words could be related to the fur trade from Scotland rather than lynx originating from Scotland themselves, but another text from the 1500s makes it more likely that the lynx still survived here. In reference to the deception of the Pope's money collector, it was written that he hath more variety of them than the cat of the mountain hath spots in his skin. As a Highland resident cat, and the only spotted wild feline from Scotland, this is likely a reference to Scottish lynx still being around. Finally, into the early 1600s, and we come across a note by the same British naturalist about the fur of lynxes. Translated into English, he relays what someone that he knows in Germany told him, that moreover, of those lynxes of ours which may be caught in Muscovy, Lithuania, Russia, Poland, Hungary, Germany, are rarely so greatly speckled with spots on the back, but only on the belly. On the other hand, Scotland and Sweden send the most beautiful of all of them. Of these, I say, they are spotted both on the back and only the belly and other areas, and they are neither so greatly shaggy nor soft as ours, though they have rough, serrated, short hairs. Actually, the spots of ours are circular, of these the respective spots of their are triangular and similar to the leaf you call the clover. In fact, another account from the same time mentions Scottish and Swedish lynx being valued for their triangular shaped spots and delicate fur. And so at last we arrive back to the source from the 1700s, which I described earlier, and which seems to be pointing to the survival of lynx in the southern Scottish uplands. Now there is the possibility that this source is referencing red foxes, wild cats or pine martens, but based on a comparison to the characteristics of those different species and the other evidence that I've mentioned here, I'm leaning more towards the possibility that lynx might have been surviving in Scotland as little as 300 years ago. The UK ranks within the lowest 10% of countries in the world for its biodiversity. There are vast gaps in our ecosystem that mean that many species left here are barely clinging on. One missing part can send an entire ecosystem into a slow spiralling collapse. A huge missing part in UK ecosystems is the absence of our top predators. Reintroducing the lynx has been suggested as a way to fill in the gap in our ecosystem and improve the health and balance of nature across Britain. But before we can reintroduce them, we need to understand the arguments for and against them returning. I know that the reintroduction of lynx into the UK is a hugely controversial subject, and so I'd be really interested to hear your personal thoughts on it in the comments below. And please do let me know if any of the ideas that I present during the rest of this video are new to you. The first concern that people tend to have with the idea of reintroducing the lynx to the UK is one that I've already mentioned in this video, which is that lynx haven't been here for over a thousand years, and so our environment and they are not suited towards each other. However, with this evidence that I've presented, there is a possibility that lynx are much more recent residents, and therefore our environment may actually be suffering without them. 
The second concern that people have is that the lynx won't have enough natural prey in Scotland and so will target livestock like lambs and birds. The most recent texts that talk about lynx in Britain also talk about the fact that farmers were in conflict with them. However, around 300 years ago, particularly in the Scottish uplands and further back throughout Britain, we were extremely low on natural lynx prey. Their preferred prey of roe deer, red deer calves and mountain hares didn't overlap with lynx habitats at the time, while the brown hare hadn't even been introduced to Britain yet and rabbits were still coastal. It's thought that the lack of natural prey for the lynx pushed them into conflict with landowners, taking what they could from people. However, this isn't just speculation. In modern Norway, they have extremely low density roe deer populations, and they also graze their sheep in woodland areas, which is the lynx's natural habitat. They have thousands of sheep here taken by lynx in a year. Even despite these less than ideal conditions, roe deer are still the most common prey these lynx hunt. In hotspots of attacks on sheep, sheep only make up around 3% of lynx diets. But if lynx went after livestock because of a lack of natural prey, who's to say it won't happen now? Firstly, deer numbers in Britain have recovered over the last few hundred years, so much so that we have 50% more deer than our land is supposed to be able to support. In regions of Europe that have similar deer densities, the predation of lynx on sheep is very rare, despite these regions having intense shepherding. Secondly, the majority of Scottish sheep are actually grazed out in the open, so they might not have as much habitat overlap with the lynx as you think they would, because the lynx will prefer to stay in the woodland hunting their preferred roe deer prey. Over 80% of sheep kills by lynx occur within 200 metres of a forest edge, so grazing your sheep out in the open away from the forest edge significantly reduces the risk of lynx taking them. Additionally, lynx will leave remnants of their deer meals. This will attract populations of scavengers, drawing them away from livestock and improving the health of soil. The third concern that people have with reintroductions is that there's a lack of habitat for lynx. But again, this isn't necessarily true. In order to learn the location, size and connectivity of forest habitats that would suit lynx, a research group ran a computer model to track how populations would change over a hundred years from different release sites. They found that releasing 10 lynx in the Kintyre Peninsula would result in an 83% chance that a hundred years later lynx would still be around and would have spread throughout the forest habitat. It's thought that the Scottish Highland forests could support as many as 400 individual lynx. These lynx would provide a free management service to solve the deer overpopulation problem, which would lead to the regeneration of degraded woodlands and also help Scotland to store more carbon. A fifth concern that people may have is that lynx would be dangerous to people walking through Scotland. Lynx are often referred to as ghost cats, being rarely seen as they keep out of the way in deep forests. They are solitary animals that control huge territories, so the chance of coming across them is very low. I found multiple sources declaring that there had never been an attack on a person by a lynx. Now I'm not really comfortable with the idea of saying never, so I went digging into this myself, and the only sources that I could find of lynx attacks were by captive lynx. These lynx had been raised to not be fearful of humans and to be overly familiar with them, and they'd bitten someone during a feeding gone wrong. Now I'm not saying that it's never happened, but I couldn't find any sources that showed an attack by a wild lynx. The final concern with lynx reintroduction that I'm going to cover today is the idea that humans might threaten the lynx and illegally kill them. As I hope this video has laid out already, there's some pretty strong evidence that's pro-lynx reintroduction. However, if people aren't willing to share their land with the lynx, as our ancestors once did, then there would be no point in even trying a lynx reintroduction. Lynx would prove to have great benefits to our ecosystem and the health of our vegetation. However, there's still a risk that they might take livestock. Thankfully, there are more mitigation and compensation strategies that have been proven to work in similar situations of people living and farming alongside large carnivores around the world. One huge benefit of a carnivore is that they're a great tourist draw. Tourists, if marketed too correctly, will flock to the area after the reintroduction of the lynx and bring in much needed revenue. This revenue could be used to compensate any farmers for potential livestock losses. But before we even get to the stage of needing to compensate farmers, the best thing to do is put mitigations in place. One I mentioned earlier is to graze sheep in the open rather than in woodlands, but there are still more. 
In Switzerland, the use of guarding animals to accompany flocks, like dogs, donkeys and llamas, has reduced lynx attacks on sheep and goats from 219 to less than 20 a year. Even if there was a situation where too many sheep were being killed, it might not be an issue with lynx as a whole, but with one individual lynx. Problem animals appear in many animal species, such as in livestock hunting lions and window breaking elephants over in southern Africa. Having a mitigation plan for how to deal with problem animals that crop up is a great way of showing that people in these areas will be listened to if they find that the problem with living with one of these animals becomes too great. In Switzerland, if a lynx takes more than 15 sheep a year, they are shot, while in other locations that have larger, more stable populations of lynx, a certain amount are removed each year as part of a hunting quota. By ensuring the lynx population doesn't get out of control, rural areas gain increased tolerance for coexistence with this species. With vast woodland cover and plenty of natural prey, the question is less about whether lynx could live in Scotland and more whether people would allow them to live in Scotland. In order to investigate the attitudes of people towards lynx reintroduction, there's been a study running over the last year called Lynx to Scotland. If this study finds that there's way too much opposition and people are completely against it, then at least we know that that's the case, and they'll say that lynx reintroduction isn't currently a plausible option. However, if people are more on the side of considering it, then there could be the potential for a controlled trial reintroduction and see how it goes from there. If you enjoyed this longer format video where I introduce you to a current conservation topic in the UK and the arguments surrounding it, make sure to give this video a like to let me know. And then check out some of my other videos to keep learning about UK nature.